The announcements are very simple today. The Understanding Salvation class is still rolling. This is week five uh, of a six-week class that I think is actually going to run into seven. So you can, uh, if you're not enrolled, um, tuition is free, number one, yeah. and uh, Ted doesn't care who comes. So you can just come and you know, you're really get blessed by it. Um, really digging into the idea of understanding that salvation is more than a, a one-shot ticket, a one-shot deal. It's, it's, uh, it's a lifelong, eternal process of uh, reforming you into uh, his image, his uh, holy image, actually. So it's really good, but uh, we're glad you're here this morning. We're going to jump into some worship. We're going to ready to worship. The worship crew was here this morning, worshiping before, and... Uh, Smiling faces, and uh, you know, we prayed this morning that, um, that we would that our worship would be not out of duty but out of desire. I think sometimes we check off boxes um, of duty. I know I do this. I had it revealed to me not long ago. That I just do things because I'm supposed to. There's a difference in how God responds to desire. When we do things out of desire, when we do things out of true love for Him, true relationship, true intimacy is different than just doing something because He wants us to. I can submit to Him because He asked me to, but when I willingly submit because I want to, He's pleased by that. Amen. It's a it's a it's a sacrifice. It's giving Him something. He He wants you more than anything else in the universe. That's all. You. You think about that. There's seven some billion people in the, in the world right now. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you. It's pretty cool. The greatest thing you can offer is you. So just remember that as we go into worship this morning. If you would stand to your feet and uh, we're going to worship, see where God wants to take us this morning. I would ask that you just open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to speak to you this morning. We have permission to do that. As children, we have permission to go boldly to the throne and say, God, what's up? Pop, I got a problem. Pop, I want to hear from you. Holy Spirit, I need you to come for me this morning. So, Lord, we just uh, we thank you for your goodness this morning, God. We thank you for your mercy. Again, God, your grace. Thank you for your unchanging
If, uh, if you're new here today, we welcome you. I'm glad you're here. If you're old here today, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. If you're middle-aged, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Uh, we love you. I, I have a I have to confess a couple things as pastor. Uh, is Molly's mic still on? Um, I've been doing some archery hunting more than I have in the past years. More this week, in, in, in the combined past 10 or 15 years of my life, and it's been very, very a blessing. And so I saw five or six really nice bucks. And then Wednesday, I saw Barney come out. And I have to confess that I've been showing everybody a picture on my phone of him. So please see Barney after church. And my wife has now declared that maybe it's an idol. So I just join with me in prayer about that. Did you get him? No, I didn't get him. I didn't even get to shoot at him yet. He hasn't come close enough. But uh, I just wanted to throw that out. So, that you know I'm not perfect, or don't, you don't think that I am. Think that, just ask my wife what to dispel that myth. Um, I'm excited about today's word, including me Friday morning. I think, is that when I gave you the message, Kate, the title for Kate Sheila? Anyways, oh, there she is. Yeah. Um, I have a, the, the title here is, is Your Past is Past. And, and really, what I want to talk more about is not even your past, but what it has to do with your future. The, the thing I keep running into is, is the enemy shaping and guilting people um, out of the, what the blood purchased for them. And people walking in shame with their heads down in guilt, on fear, and, and in fear of judgment, and fear of guilt. And we could go on and on and on. I don't want to camp out there. Because that's demonic territory, and he doesn't deserve my attention longer than I can get the crosshair on him and pull the trigger and tell him to go somewhere else. And so, can we put up Revelation, that first one, 12, 11? The, the reality, the, the idea of spiritual warfare is very real. Um, by the way, thank you veterans. Happy Veterans Day. Um, as I was praying in the back this morning, thinking about the, the, the battle of the natural, we can see, we can turn on the news and, and see destruction and see what's happening and we understand why. Um, it's a spirit, so there's spiritual reasons behind it. But the battle in the spiritual realm is just as real. In fact, I think sometimes even more real. I think spiritual warfare is one of those things that we don't want to talk about. We want to say, I'm a, I did really good today. I was a good Christian. I checked off my boxes and prayers, and I'm going to run along now. But spiritual warfare is something that we need to understand. It's one of my favorite things to teach. We're kind of going to go there a little bit today. But what I said to start out with, there was never, there was never a contest at the cross. It was, not like, it was not like God had to grunt to defeat Satan. He, he just didn't. He's, he's all-powerful. It wasn't like, a, you know what I'm saying? But in, in the reality then, once after the cross, when you received Jesus Christ as Savior, when you committed your life to him, the battle is believing. It's always about faith. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. If I wanted to gain something in the kingdom of God, I must come believing that it's true. It says in Hebrews, without faith, you can't get anything from God. You cannot please God. It's just the faith is the way we enter in. Faith is the, what we, we, we purchase with. And that battle is up here. And it's, it's, it's really, remember Ripley's Believe It or Not? They would show you something, you know, the girl with 10 foot fingernails. You know, what, do you believe it or not? You know, it's just is it that true. Uh, I don't know how that woman functioned, but they would show that and then say, do you believe it or do you not? And really, the reality in spiritual warfare comes down to this. When I'm believing something or not believing something, I ask myself this question, who told me that? Who told me that? What? Where did my information come from? Brother, you're a scumbag, loser, you're never going to amount to anything, you're terrible at your job because I worked with you for years, and on and on and on. Where does that voice come from? Does it come from God? Is that his nature? It's not true about my brother. He's very, very good at what he does. I learned a lot from him. I just can't remember any of it right now. But, but when those voices come, when those things come, it's, it's, it's okay. I, I'm going to position myself 
and say, is this what God says about me? Or is this what the enemy says about me? So it's, spiritual warfare now becomes simple where it's like, believe it or not. I believe him or I believe not. I teach it this way sometimes. In the cartoons in the old days, they had the devil on the shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder. You know, the angels whisper, don't do it. The devil's poking, say, do it. It's, it's kind of like that. The enemy wants to malign that to the point where it's confusing. He, he, he likes to confuse. Does anybody ever feel confused about voices that you're hearing, thoughts you're having? Well, there's a reason for that. It's a spiritual reason. He wants to confuse you so you don't know which ones to believe. So what do we do? I love this, this, these. There's two tools in here that just, I, I believe, have been undermined by the church. There's two tools in here for you to learn how to fight a spiritual battle. And it has to do with both of these things have to do with what has happened in the past. I, I said your past is past because I don't want you to remember your failings in a negative manner. They will tell you, you learn from your mistakes. That's true. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I learned how not to do it. But that doesn't mean I know how to do it right. I could, I could, I could build a house wrong a thousand times, but I still might not know how to do it right. That makes sense. I don't want to entertain the things that in my past brought me shame, guilt, regret, ill feeling, belittleness, on and on and on. I don't have time to engage those thoughts on this side of the cross. It, it, it's just not something I want to entertain. And so what do we entertain? So he's talking, um, that, that this is John writing in Revelation, and he's talking about basically how we overcame, how the people that are in the, in the throne room see how they overcame the enemy. They overcame him because of the two things, the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they loved their own life not even when faced with death. Basically, that's a fancy way of saying they're dying for themselves to, to live to totally for Jesus and free. So when I read this, I see, okay, there's two things here, the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Blood of the Lamb, word of the testimony. What are, what are those two things? They are absolute <coughs> empirical realities that happen. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. It happened. It's true. His blood was shed, and it purchased you. It, it, you were bought with that blood. You were ransomed back. If you belonged to him, you were repurchased back from him. If you think of it this way, in, in the natural, if I, if I kidnap uh, Isaiah, which I just might one of these days because he's cute, and I and I offer, and, and now I possess him. I'm the bad guy, right? So in the spiritual realm, when we sin, we're, we're, we're kind of like Satan's, we don't really belong to him. We, he has dominion over us. Right? He has control over us. So if I say, Chad, I have Isaiah. Um, I, I need something really valuable for you to get him back. Chad would be like, well, uh, you can have all my guns, and you can have my truck, you can have my house, my everything. And I'll be like, okay, that sounds like a good deal. Well, what he offers to me is something very valuable because I have something valuable of his. And in, in, the, in the spiritual realm, when you were purchased, when that blood was shed, when you received him and committed to him, you were purchased back. Now you're not yours anymore. But that blood is your the first weapon in line. The blood says, number one, who you are. You're his. You're, you're, you're not your own anymore. You were purchased back. And so when Isaiah gets purchased back by Chad... He's now Chad's possession again. He's under Chad's authority. Chad's dad, Chad's boss. What Chad says goes. Don't get a power trip here, brother. But, <laughs> but you, you understand what I'm saying. You were purchased back with that blood. I, I think sometimes we, we back away from the, the, the value of the blood and say, I want to plead the blood of Jesus over this situation. Something happened in my life, and I'm saying no. I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus. There's a billion reasons for every one of us in this room to have shame, regret, guilt, fear, all that stuff. And I, no, I want to plead the blood of Jesus over that. I was teaching yesterday at another place, and we're, we're talking about, I'm talking to teenagers, and the number one thing that they're almost all suppressed by is those things, those ideas. They're not from God. And 
what, what happens when I start pleading the blood over those things, especially out loud, the enemy can't stand it. There's an old song that says he can't stand the sight of blood, right? Maybe it's a southern gospel. I know I heard it somewhere. Why? Because it's true. He knows it. He knows it. He was wolf. Weapon number one. Then the weapon number two was the word of their testimony. And that's why I want to camp out. I want to camp out on testimony today. I love telling stories. I could tell you more stories about Barney. I got to watch him last night for an hour. He's out of range. It's just torturous. Anyways. There's another scripture that talks about testimony. Uh, Revelation uh, 19.10. So you're getting that. Testimony. Testimony is your wep- one of your weapons. Tuck that away in your noggin. Um, then this happened. And then then uh, a fellow to speak to worship him, he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours. This is John talking. John is not worthy of worship. This other dude fell down to worship. John's like, no, don't worship me. Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. And brethren, who by the testimony of Jesus, I worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, we're getting churchy words going here, right? We got testimony happening. We got we got prophecy happening. What what about all that? Here's what about all that. I'm going to try to make this as simple simple as I can. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy because what Jesus said is true, and what prophecy is is hearing God's word, hearing God's intentions, and releasing it. When I'm preaching, I'm prophesying. I'm, I'm releasing the heart of God. That's just my job. When you are witnessing to somebody, you are prophesying. Why? Because you're telling a story that is true. It's your testimony of what Jesus did in your life. You're prophesying that this is what he can do for you. And this is where the enemy really, really hates it because testimony, in the Old Testament, is really cool. I learned this this week. In the Old Testament, some places, testimony means repeat. So in other words, it means do it again. And I love the song we did this morning because that's what God wants to do again. He is the same now, forever and always. Right? So if that's true, I've, I've, I've read some pretty far out stories in my Bible of healings. I should have announced this at the beginning. My heart for the end of this is to have testimonies. So as I'm teaching, if you have a testimony, I'm going to allow time to share at the end. I love to hear testimonies. I, I, I love it. The enemy hates it. I think that's maybe why I love it. it, 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 it hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Do you know even the people that didn't really like him called him a prophet? And I recognized something this week. People that said they didn't believe in him asked him questions that asserted his deity. What do you mean by that? They would they asked him questions that that he would not possibly be able to answer without being divine. What, okay, I, I don't know if that's coming across. Is that, so if I ask, if I ask Justin about a fire engine, it's assuming that I understand that's who he is, right? So I would expect to ask him about how many gallons a minute the engine pump um, puts out, and he would be able to tell me because that's who he is. And so the, the, when Jesus was prophesying, it was that true that even the people that did not want to submit to him realized he was really who he says he was. Why? Because he was prophesying out of the truth of testimony. The works of the enemy were being destroyed when he opened his mouth. Why? Because he was the word. Irrefutable. He was the word from the beginning. He even said to the people that said they don't believe who he said he says he was, you both know me and you know where I am from. Why is that true? Because he was prophesying from reality, from an empirical truth 
that really happened, really Jesus really came. And so all the things that he said were absolutely true, undeniable, even by the people that didn't like him. That's when it got really interesting. And they're like, this dude's right. He's really the son of God. He's going to disrupt some things. We've got to get rid of him. Bang, they hung him on a cross. I say this to, to, to Bill. Um, can you put the last one up? I'm going to try to really be brief here. Um, Psalm 119, 111. And you ever read Psalm 119? That's the chapter. It's 176 verses. So there's a lot of meat in that psalm. Um, by the way, Psalms is the most quoted um, book in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a little tidbit for you. It's something that gets built in me when God does a work in me. Do you know this? God is a builder. That's his nature. He, he's always adding. I, I've said this already. If he has an adding machine in, in front of him, he's got the, uh, this, the addition symbol. It's like this big and he pushes it a lot. He, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's a promise. He wants to add to the church. I, I think the church is under a lie there. This is the church is shrinking. The church is going away. No, no. The church is bigger now than ever. There's more Christians now than ever. So he's a builder. And he says this in Psalms, I have inherited your testimonies, the writer of Psalms. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Whose testimony is he talking about? The things that, the things that God has done. Here's what happens when I inherit something. If, if Rob dies tomorrow and he wills me his four-wheelers and, and kayaks and guns, they're mine to possess. What does that give you? It gives me something greater than I had before. Now I have the ability to drive up in the woods where I used to have to walk. I can, I can ride on the river where I used to have to swim. I can, I can shoot a, a deer with a gun where I used to have to chase him down in spirit or, or whatever. You get my point. What, what God is doing in testimonies, in stories, when, when he's working in your life, when he's done a miracle, when he's set you free from bondage of some sort, when he's brought you out of the wilderness, what he's doing is he's actually building in you. He's creating you. He's saying, this is something that you didn't have before. And when I read this, I'm like, I want, I want to inherit all the testimonies of God. I want to own the testimonies of God, that all the good things that God's ever done. I don't have time anymore to discuss or worry about what I did wrong. I want to own the testimonies of what God has done in me. Here's what begins, becomes built in me. It, it, do you know that you can be reminded? If I, she reminds me on the way home to get milk, I'll probably forget anyways. That's one form of reminding. But when I get reminded, I think differently. And when I establish, when my thoughts, ideas, and other things are becoming established on the things that God has done in my life, guess what I don't have time for anymore? Come on, church. This is good. This is where it gets really good. I don't have time for the littleness in my past when I have greatness in my future. I don't have time to hide under what could have been, I should have done, I didn't do right, in light of what God has done and is going to do in light of repeating. If you think about the way God works, he's a repeater. Pete and repeat, Pete and repeat, Pete and repeat. When Jesus came and taught, he repeated himself over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It's just who he is. It's just because we're stubborn. But what happens if I refuse to believe what my past says about me and start camping out on the promises of God and start saying, no, Satan, the battle is won. I'm not even going to fight you. I'm not fighting you today, Satan. I'm not. I'm fighting me. I'm choosing to believe did it really happen or did it not? Am I going to bank on the testimonies that I know are absolutely true? I know what happened to me when I got saved. This is my personal testimony. I know what happened. No one can talk me out of that. I know what happened when she touched me and healed me one time down at the river lot. There was no one taking that from me. I know that God touched her in a hospital room and healed her from asthma in an instant. I, I, and I know that my brother uh, watched his life change when he submitted to the Lord. I, the, I, I could go on and on and on. There's, there's another one right there. you got some of you. I see God work in your life, and it's irrefutable. You know what it does to me? <laughs> it builds me up. Do you know what I love? When someone comes to me and says, guess what God's doing in my life? Guess what God showed me? 
Guess what God's removed from you? Guess what miracle God did this week and I got to be a part of it? Guess what I got to see? I got to see someone healed this week. Guess what? I watched a leg grow out. Guess what? I watched the Red Sea part. What if we start believing that that is where we camp out? That's where we think from. The church has gone too far away. God doesn't heal anymore. What? It says it's the same then, now, and forever. I'm, I'm sorry. I just the, the testimony is there. It's true. And when I get when I get empowered by that, God's building in me. It, it's it's so it's so good because I can't I can't preach. The gospel out of an empirical idea anymore. I preach it because I know what happened in here. It's not an idea. It's 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 a testimony. It's actually true. You know the word testimony has test at the beginning. You know that when you grow the most is when you're being tested. He says, consider it all joy, brethren, when you incur various trials, knowing that when you suffer well in them, you're going to get increased. You choose to suffer well, you get increased. It, it is, growth is hard. Without fire, without the fire of God refining you, we don't grow. And fire hurts. And that's where the battle is. Now, now I get to choose, in light of that battle, how I'm going to believe, and what am I going to, how is my testimony going to get built out of that? If God's calling me into something deep, that is uncomfortable and not pretty, and I choose to back away, we have refused God, number one, and it says, he says, those who are opposed to him are proud, and they don't get honor, and they don't get increase. And in that place is the choice to, to say, what, what story do I want to carry out of this? Do I want to carry out, I'm a coward, I didn't face it? You know you can't conquer anything unless you face it. We are more than conquerors, but not if you don't face it. And in light of that, when I face something, when I choose to enter into that battle rightly, I get what? I get a really cool story. Veterans Day is coming up, and tomorrow, and not in a glory way, but I like to hear guys talk about their experiences in battle. And there's a couple reasons. I think for some, they need to speak it out to get it out. But it speaks to me of what they willingly went through for me. And that, that, that just rocks my world. Like, they don't even know me. And quite frankly, it's not a great paying job, I don't think. And it's, you don't, you know, sometimes you get back and they spit on you. But they did that for me. And I was in the mall four or five years ago. I love to talk to people. And, and uh, I sat down on a bench. She was in some store. I didn't want to go in with her smelling, probably. And uh, I sat down on a bench beside this, this guy, this old pruned up dude with the World War II hat on. And I just, I just um, started talking to him. I, I, talk, I, th I thank him for his service, I think. And before I knew it, this guy was telling me all about his past. And then he's going into the, the war. And he went deep. And I was like, kind of like, okay, I didn't really, I wasn't drawing it out of him. And he stopped in the middle of it and he said, I've never told him this to anybody before. I was rocked. This guy's in his 80s. I never told anybody about this war. Complete strength. I don't know what was going on there. I, I think it was God affirming a gift in me. And it's nothing that I, I was humbly received that. He felt comfortable sharing that. But I thought that in that moment, I realized, wow, man, your story is powerful. Not only is it powerful, it's powerful when you tell it. Like, I wasn't getting up and running away in the light of that moment where he willingly ran into a battle and came home with a really cool story. How many of you know the battle on the spiritual front is a lot more at stake? The battles on the battlefield here are important. But the battle in the spiritual realm is for keeps, man. It's eternal. Hell is for real. And there are going to be people that go there. But what if your story is the one that wakes someone up? What if what if what God did to you, your experience, I, I hear so many, I, I love, love, I just never get tired of hearing stories of our marriages about, like, we were going to do paperwork, man. We were done. And then God saved us. But we had to fight. I'm like, oh, it's so good. And then, and, and then it's always this with God in that. 
There's always an increase. Our marriage is better now than it was before. Our marriage is better now before than that. It's what he does. If you think about the battles that the, 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 the Israelites faced in the Old Testament, almost all the time, God, all, it was one of his habits. He said, you worship me, I will deliver you, and then I'm going to cause an increase. It was just a habit of, who he, of what he did. Worship, God gives the battle into your hands. It's God's battle, not yours. And you come out with increase. Whenever you enter into a battle and face it rightly with the Lord and standing with promises, I will guarantee you, promise you 100%, you will always come out with increase. Amen. Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20, one of my favorites. Shaking in his boots. Armies are coming. All the bad guys, the Israelites, are coming, man. And he's just, he's just in trouble. He cries out, God says, go over there on that hill on worship. And he caused the armies to confound themselves. Next thing you know, the armies all killed themselves for coming after Jehoshaphat. But guess what happened at the end of that story? Jehoshaphat got all their stuff. He inherited all their, what was called spoils in the Old Testament. What, great, what does that mean? So he got like oxen probably, he got livestock, he got gold, he probably got weapons, he probably got chariots, he might have got who knows what. What's the point? When Jehoshaphat went through that battle and he got increased, guess what it caused him to be in the next battle? Stronger. It's his spiritual principle. It's what God wants to do in you. I want to propose to you, I, I think sometimes we don't share Jesus because we're scared and we like, think we need to like quote a bunch of scripture and be like really churchy and be super spiritual. I, I think that many times, greater than that is your personal testimony is more powerful. Why? Because it says it. It, says, it doesn't say we overcome by you being churchy. We overcome by you Bible thumping somebody and telling them they're nasty and they're, and they're going to hell if they don't change their mind, which is true. That's true. But it's not, it's, it wasn't a habit of Jesus to do that, so it doesn't become my habit. It doesn't say we overcome by um, worshiping Barney. It says the blood in your testimony. I love when God simplifies things. Because I, I, I'm a one-track thinker. <laughs> Heather can testify. I, I don't like to think it of more than one thing at a time. And when I do, it doesn't go well. God has a habit of doing this. And I, I'll lay this out for you guys and I can try to get a picture. If you're facing a battle right now, and there's, I don't know how many chairs here, a dozen or 15 or something. And you're facing a battle in your life where you got something going on. And there's problem number one is finance. Problem number two is my um, job. Problem number three, things aren't good at home. Problem number four, I'm anxious. Problem number five, um, I have desires that aren't holy. Problem number six, I, I have uh, fear, guilt, shame, rejection. You can go on down the list. And here's what the enemy wants to do with you. This is his tactic. He wants you to face that whole thing one at one shot and say, what are you going to do about all that crap in your life? Dude, this is overwhelming to you. You can't possibly face this, man. You can't. Here's what God wants you to do. This is his nature. It's not the nature of God to put all that stuff in front of you at one time. It's his nature to say, I want you to do one thing and one thing today, whatever it is. I want you to face one thing because you're just not equipped to face those all right now. What's my point? The point is, do what God puts in front of you. <clears throat> just, just make it simple. Do what God puts in front of you. There's a lot of weight lifted off your shoulders at that moment. And I want to propose to you this. A lot of those things that we're facing, God has already conquered. Do I believe it? Or am I on the fence? That's where it's at. Who told me that? Where did I get that idea? Where did I get my information? What paper am I reading? You know, you, Facebook, you can believe everything on Facebook, right? Oh, it says it here, it's got to be true. You can believe everything I just told you on Facebook, Facebook people, that is true. So, in light of that, um, I have, this thought as we were practicing worship this morning if we're going to after however many people want to talk I hope it's a handful at least um, and if you're not comfortable being on Facebook while you're talking that's a, that's a turn off or 
block it or some put a piece of tape over the lens. But if God's in the nature of repeating, we were sang the song this morning, do it again, and afterward we're gonna do it again, we're gonna do it again, we're gonna do do it again, again. Why? I, I want to get that idea in my in my head that what God already did for Justin, what he did for my brother, what he did in me, he wants to do again. He wants to do it again in me. He wants to do it again in you. He wants to do it again in you. It's just it's just who he is. So, how many people want to come and I get excited. I love, love, love stories, testimonies. Anybody have anything? If you let me hang in, I'm going to be totally embarrassed. So I'll turn red and we'll just worship and then we'll go home. Anybody have a God story? You don't even have to come front. You can just stand up or talk. All right, no Facebook, but yeah, go ahead. I just want to say that my testimony is that God has healed me of cancer back in 2002. I went through three surgeries in four weeks and had six months of chemo, and I just thank him every day for my life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sharing. Nobody else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so last week as we were sitting here, uh, I knew this week I'd, I would share some of my testimony, but I didn't know what that would look like. And then you brought it up and it just affirmed to me that I was supposed to do it today. Uh, as some of you know, I was I was deployed to Iraq in 2004, and during that time, I was in one of the the most dangerous cities in the world. And that's that's where we operated out of every day, and there were a lot of things going on there. Um, saw a lot of things I wish I wouldn't have seen, but through it all, before every every mission we would go on, we would get together as a as a group, everyone in the convoy that was willing to participate, we'd go to the front and we would always say a prayer uh, and bless that convoy that we could get where we were going and home safely. And every single time we did, uh, the people, some of the other troops on the road that were from the Allied forces, they, they weren't as fortunate as we were. Um, I don't know what they were doing beforehand, but I, kn I know Every mission I was on, there was a prayer said before, and Thanksgiving after, and uh, and I'm here today, obviously, mostly unscathed, thanks to that. Uh, because of that, I was able to come home and see my daughter, um, who was born while I was there. Uh, I was able to have another child later, and, and two wonderful stepchildren, uh, as well as some of the other things I do in my life. As Dan points out, obviously I'm a firefighter, uh, but that's only volunteer. My full-time job, I believe, affects a lot more people. Uh, and I believe I was I was able to come home safely so that I could I could do those things and be a father to my children. And there's no there was, none of that had anything to do with with what I did. It was all God. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for serving. While you're out there, find some prayer to you. All right. God, we thank you for this gentleman here today who uh, didn't even know me when he got sent off, but willingly went. I thank you for him. We just pray for all our veterans today, God. We just uh, pray that we would be honoring to them. Um, we pray that you would bless them, Father. Bless this man and his family and what he's doing and, and, and his life. God, we thank you for bringing him back safely because now I got a brother I didn't have. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, man. Anybody else? Nobody? I want, uh, I, my brother wants to share, oh, this is going to get long. Not long. Um, I'm going to share just a, a testimony of what God's going to do. Um, 
because it's powerful it's powerful to know what happened and to, to rest in that and to know he did that um, but he gives us power and he gives us authority to know what he's going to do and rest in that for about a year and a half I've been struggling with some health things and at, at various times I've been completely immobile flat out on my back not able to do an office job and he's good in that uh, and you know a lot of times I'm, I can whip the snot out at anyone in my weight class but it's been a long slog and uh, so so the the doctors that I'm seeing and there's uh, you know count them up maybe half a dozen people whose lives are dedicated to reading textbooks and applying wisdom and glad we are for all of them um, they, and they're they're telling me something that uh, a lot of people would believe and that's fine but God has reminded me that that's that's a thought that's an idea that's a direction um, but I can choose to have another thought, another idea, another direction, another reality, and I'm placing my faith in this camp. This is the direction I'm going. This is what I'm setting my eyes on. I'm not decrepit. I'm not going downhill. I'm not limited by my, my back or my doctor's prognosis or their treatments or the painkillers. Um, that's not my limitation. That's not my destiny. That's not what um, speaks to me. And it's a position of my heart to believe God for more and for increase and for help. And it's very uplifting when you're in constant pain and your doctors are, are being negative Nancy sometimes to be able to say, well, I appreciate that and thank you. And I'll even pay you for that opinion that I can put in the trash can on my way out of your office because I choose to believe what the Lord says and follow him. So that testimony isn't, isn't of what happened, but it's nonetheless a reality that I can camp on and live from. So Amen. I praise God for that. Amen. Yeah, it's still in the healing business. Amen. Weird people out sometimes, but um, he talked to me out of it. I read it a couple of times. So we don't have any more worship people you want to come up and bless our way out of here we're going to do it again and again and uh, if you want prayer for anything grab it with somebody there's no guilt or shame in here there's no, we're all doing this together and uh, we'd love to pray for you um, I want to encourage you with this closing remark and uh It's just simple, uh, nothing earth shattering. It's just what what promise of God do I need to stand on for my next testimony, for my next miracle? What 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 battle can I shut down by saying, "Oh, this is what God says"? Just a simple question. Again, makes your spiritual walk with Him simple. He's not asking you to fix it all in one day. It's just who He is. He's good. We're gonna worship our way out of here a little bit, and then we're gonna do it again. God's going to do it again. How many believe that really? That he wants to do it again. That he's going to do it again. Let's stay in that camp and get ready. Father, let's pray. Father, we as a people, as a church, God, aren't wondering when or how. We're declaring that you're going to do it again because it's who you are and it's what you say you want to do. We thank you for that reality, Lord. I pray that we would camp out that our mindsets would shift to that reality. I pray, Lord, that the new church going in over here would, would, would own that reality, God, that you're going to build their church. Lord, we pray for protection and blessing over them. Lord, we pray for um, uh, Beaver Springs, the Baptist church, Lord, same. I pray that their thoughts and hearts would be that of increase and that of your promise. And Lord, um, for Chip Cummins and River Christian Fellowship, Lord, we just lift them up this morning. Same. Let their mindsets shift towards what you're going to do and, and produce increase, God. Lord, I just pray a blessing over your the entire church in our region. 
all those who belong to your body, God, that the past would be gone, an increase would come through your promise, the increase would come through your faith, for the faith in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So go encourage this week. Um, tell your story. If you don't have one, steal someone else's. It's really good. And if you don't have one, to steal from someone else, read your Bible and share that story. There's all kinds of good stories in there. So be encouraged. Just have a good week. I love you guys. See you back next week. Thanks for coming. And uh, if you have a neighbor or friend that's uh, interested in what we're doing, grab them by the shirt. Drag them on in here. Tell them you have coffee and donuts, and we love them. So have a good week. Pray for me that I get Barney. Amen. <laughs>